All right, I've defeated my smoothie. Okay, good. Uh, I also have a lunch appointment at midday, so that means that I am not able to go run over two and a half hours on this one. Oh, per- oh thank God. One guess we might get back. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> this is mostly a benefit for me because I have to edit the fucking thing. <laughs> so, so here's the thing you're not expecting, is I can talk for trees about literally four hours. <laughs> That's okay. I have, I have a verbal whip, and I'm going to whip us back into line on the regular. Yeah. She has a gun. <laughs> yeah, but the gun only works on you. That's right. I have several on a crossbow, so <laughs> I got that going for me. Yeah. You gotta remember, I'm American and I hunt. Yes. Well, hello, welcome to Statistically Insignificant. This is a podcast with slides about carbon credits in this case, and I'm here walking through a forest, and I have with me my wonderful companions, Dean and Bart. How are you two going? Are you enjoying this vista? My feet hurt. I want some food. I don't have phone (laughs) reception. (laughs) Yeah, you can't look at your... I don't know, you're not on TikTok. What are you looking at on your phone? Discord. Discord, yeah, okay. My Discord DMs. Oh, my classic. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And, oh no, what's this? There's a strange forest creature poking around the bottom of a tree and muttering to himself. It's Kelvin Norman, who is an assistant teaching professor of forestry at Penn State University. And he has several guns and a crossbow. He does. Incredibly well. (laughs) I do. Um, for this yeah. forest adventure. How are you going? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Also, right now when I'm in the woods, I usually carry herbicides as well. Ah. I can kill most things that I come across. <laughs> <laughs> Any fungi that you can kill? No. No, uh, that's the one thing I can't. Mm. No. That's about no, it. No, no, nobody can. No. No, yeah, it's true. It's really tough. The more yeah. you learn about mushrooms and how they like communicate with each other, the more you freaked out you get by them. Oh, yeah. oh, they are eldritch. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I do plants and wildlife and People ask me about fungus all the time. I'm like, no, that's a whole different like <laughs> kingdom. <laughs> no, no, that's a no. For yeah, you're gonna have different licenses for that. Yeah. That's a whole other thing. Yeah. Can I just ask carbon credits? I assume we're talking about the phenomenon and not like the credits of carbon. We're not trying to talk about the uh, the merits, as it were. Well, it's credits, not merits, Dean. That's true. Although I would like to say, as carbon based life forms, we kind of can't complain too much about it. We have to credit it with that. Yes. As opposed to merit it? Yeah. My use of the word was correct. I'm standing by it. Uh-huh. <laughs> so specifically, we are talking about carbon credits as this interesting little financialized instrument that has come along and is apparently going to save us all from climate change. Maybe I'm jumping ahead here, but I don't view the notes for a reason. So let's say I am polluter mm-hmm. and I want to keep polluting because um, this aluminium isn't going to weld itself to its own, to a baby on its own. Yeah. I buy carbon credits. Yes. But I'm still welding the aluminium to a baby. And presumably in the process emitting some carbon. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing a whole bunch of carbon. I don't know if that's really a carbon producing thing. I'm doing... Well, I mean, the, the energy required I'm running to the big factory the from Captain Planet yeah. that makes him cry. Yeah. yeah. And presumably, if I'm paying someone to means I can keep doing it, I'm still running the big factory that makes Captain Planet cry. Yes. We will, in fact, get to that. Okay, but yeah. Yes. Sorry, yeah, I'm skipping ahead here. <laughs> All right, sure. It just seems to me that to be that that's kind of the end of the episode because the factory is still running. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, yes. So, first off, first okay. off, we're going to say, how do carbon credits... Leave it there. How do carbon credits... Yeah. Work in theory. That's a very interesting question, and it depends on who you ask, is what I'll tell you. Yeah, right. Because my perspective is that... In theory, emissions in one place, so somebody's putting out some amount of CO2 or whatever, are compensated for by the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere somewhere else. That's the theory as I understand it. Well, that's part of it. The other... So what is happening here is we'll go back to our big crime factory. So we have our factory emitting carbon. Let's say you're probably emitting lots of other things. Yeah. But but we're going to only focus on carbon as a greenhouse gas today because other elements require chemistry and I'm a forester, not a chemist. <laughs> so I don't I don't do chemistry. Anything past CO two and you've lost me, to be very honest. H two O I can do that one. But <laughs> yep. everything past that, I'm out. Anything with a so, three in it, too much. <laughs> no, man, far too much. Far too yeah. much. You have multiple like elements in there? No. <laughs> no. Plants have been doing chemistry for hundreds of millions of years. Why do I need to learn how to do chemistry? Exactly. Nerd stuff. It's important nerd stuff, but it's not my nerd stuff. Hmm. Our crime factory emits carbon, and then they're going to pay someone to do behavior change. So this is called additionality to capture the carbon. So that's our sequestration. Right. And then hopefully, 
they're going to store that carbon, so that's storage, for some amount of time. Now, the behavior changes the real, like, break point here. Right, okay. Because, like, if you just pay someone to do what they're doing, that's very easy to do, but there's no reason to do this. So you're saying I'm running the Crime Factory 1. Yep. uh, And I'm paying Crime Factory 2 to stop? No. Well, actually, you could be. You could be paying Crime Factory 2 to stop. You could be paying for, let's say, some, like, global south countries to, like, electrify using renewable resources to not emit carbon. Or, again, I'm going to pull this to forest because that's what I do. You're going to pay someone to do some new forest practice that will capture and store carbon at a higher rate than they were currently doing. Right. Okay. We will get later on to specific things and whether or not they do actually work. But the kind of the point here is that this is something where money is exchanged for some people to keep putting out carbon with the intention that elsewhere carbon is somehow either not put out or absorbed. And because capitalism, this has become a financialized instrument which functions kind of like negative carbon futures market. And that's basically just a way of rent seeking. So on top of this, you have the trading of carbon credits, which is how the rent seeking comes into play. With the idea being that by the, um, shall we say, invisible hand of the market, because there is the opportunity to do rent seeking on carbon credits, that will incentivize capitalists to do it. Wait, 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 wait. So if I buy a carbon credit, it's not just an abstract way of me paying someone to behavior change, whatever that equates to. I'm actually buying something called a carbon credit. Which you can then sell. Which I can then sell. Yep. How do I how do I seek rent on this? Oh, well, if you buy it at a low price and you sell it at a higher price. Right, I see, I see. Yeah. That part is not super built out yet, but it's possible. That yeah. part is very possible. And boy, are the capitalists excited about that bit. Wait, 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 wait. Hang on. Sorry, sorry I'm going to stop us one, one more time here. <laughs> uh-huh. I want to buy, lo- buy carbon credits low and sell them high. Mm-hmm. Carbon credits represent a proportion of how much... We'll uh, get to the behavior units. change there is. Kind of. We'll get to the units and things in a bit. So I would say from a business case, what you don't want to do is buy low and sell high. You want to take the money from the polluter. You want to be the middleman. So you want to take yeah, the right. money from the polluter right, and then okay. convince someone else to do the behavior change or pretend they did the behavior change. For less. Yeah, for less and then keep most of right, the money. And you, want to, <laughs> you want to arbitrate... <laughs> This sucks. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's what you want. To do. You want to do the arbitrage. Now, the good thing is, though, I will tell you, in the last three months, most of the bankers have done the arbitrage, and so this market is rapidly collapsing. Well, I say rapidly. <laughs> it, it is collapsing. However, natural resources will not catch up on this because natural resources is slow to the movement of capital yeah. for the next three years. But these contracts are very long, as we will discuss. So does this no, whole no. system rely on a country having like a state-imposed emissions trading scheme, or is it- No. Okay, right. Oh, no, this is heavily privatized. Right. It, there's actually zero regulations on almost all of this. Yeah, Ooh, incredible. I love capitalism. <laughs> yep. I will say, before we jump into this whole thing, there was a time, there is a case where- cap and trade did work and that was acid rain in the u.s with mercury and that did work but it took like 20 years and it took the epa so the uh, environmental protection agency in the u.s setting up and enforcing rigorously a scheme not very self-regulated yes yeah and on very specific industries because to emit mercury at a very high level you have to burn a lot of coal so, I don't know how many of you guys have a large coal fire furnace in your backyard. <laughs> Carbon emissions McGee is an outlier. Look, I'm trying to get yeah. I'm trying to get Maoism kicked off in Australia, so I do, but I, I understand it very <laughs> weird in this case. And if you live uh, in a particular uh, arrangement of land blocks, then the huge uh, coke smelter in your backyard can also be a coke smelter in other people's backyards. Absolutely, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is exactly communism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. The first thing I want to talk about is what is the greenhouse effect anyway? Oh, it's that fake thing. Uh, it's, it's been completely discredited, I heard, on um, Sky News. I would say several presidential candidates in the US agree with you. <laughs> mm, so we live in an atmosphere, and the atmosphere has a bunch of different gases, different chemicals in it, that interact with incoming light. 
but they also interact with the light that is reflected by and itself emitted by the planet and the rest of the atmosphere. Because physics, it turns out that if something has heat in it, it will emit light at a particular frequency associated with that heat. Mm -hmm. The atmosphere acts as a kind of a blanket around the, the Earth, and exactly which wavelengths of light are absorbed and re-emitted or just get radiated out into space depends on the chemical composition of the gases. Water vapor is actually probably the biggest contributor to this because it's got like the biggest, I guess, spread of stuff that it absorbs. But carbon dioxide is the one that we typically talk about because while it's a very, very tiny fraction of the actual gas, it's like 0.04% of the atmosphere, it plugs some of the gaps in what water vapor absorbs. So it directly amplifies the amount of energy that is absorbed and tracks pretty directly with increases in temperature as it goes up and decreases in temperature as it goes down. Add more carbon, atmosphere holds more heat. Holds more, more energy. Holds heat more energy. is part of that. I'm going to be really specific about this because energy also takes the form of movement. Mm -hmm. So your more violent storms, there's a lot more energy in a, in a more powerful storm, right? And yeah. that's not just taken in the form of heat. One of the things that global warming broadly defined, or well, we can define warming as greater holding of energy in the atmosphere, is these more violent storms. The other reason that we talk about CO2 is that we have a model for what's called the carbon cycle. So this is a global process of carbon moving between the ground, various forms of life, bodies of water, the atmosphere, and how it shows up in industry. We talk about it as carbon dioxide in the air, but it's also carbon stored in coal. It's also carbon stored in plants as cellulose or sugars in our body and our metabolic things. So carbon is moving around in different chemical forms. Yeah. And the changes between those and where it is dominating at a particular time contributes, in our case, to climate change. Right. And as I understand it, the issue is that if we keep adding carbon, the cycle will spin right back around to the dinosaurs, and then we've got a problem. Yeah, I don't want a T-Rex showing up at the front door. Precisely. Yep. And then if it keeps going, we'll get the meteor again. Yeah, and I've seen Jurassic World, and I just want to say I'm good not getting stopped by whatever those <laughs> things are. Yeah, also, yeah. I do need to correct myself. It wasn't mercury that was causing acid rain, it was sulfuric acid. Yes, I was going to say, that sounded a little odd, but yes. Look, I don't want to be rained on by either. Yeah, burning coal does add a lot of mercury. Yeah, but for different reasons. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a chemist, I'm a yeah. forester. But, on the plus side, mercury rain, everyone's hat's looking fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but the problem is we stopped wearing hats. Well, okay, because we did cap and trade to get rid of the mercury rain. It's mm. all coming together. Yeah. So other greenhouse gases, we've talked a bit of, I mentioned water vapor, which is kind of the biggest one, really. But because there's so much of it, small amounts of change don't really change that. Another one that comes up is methane. So um, methane is another carbon molecule. It's carb just carbon and hydrogen rather than carbon and oxygen. And it is more impactful in small amounts than even carbon dioxide. But we are even worse at capturing methane than we are at capturing CO2. And it's also such a small proportion of carbon overall that I don't think it really factors into carbon cycle stuff. Am I right on that? Methane does more damage. It just it comes out of the atmosphere faster. Yeah, right. Okay. I think it does like between it's either eight or thirty times more damage. There's like a number of other gases and other yeah. pollutants in here that are all considered greenhouse gases. I again we're getting. I'm not an like, atmospheric physicist, so this know. is not my job. <laughs> yeah, I, I work with climatologists for a reason. They're smarter than I am. <laughs> so what I'm hearing is, listener, hold your farts. Yeah. <laughs> if you know any cows, also hold theirs. <laughs> Stick a finger in there. Keep it. Keep it bottled. Keep a lid on that. Yeah, yeah. So, like industrialized agricultural practices are contributors, as well as like industrialized coal and that kind of thing, right? Coal and oil. Oh yeah, certainly. To a lesser, much lesser extent. A lot of that is also because to to do the industrialized stuff, you're driving around on a tractor. In fact, many things are driving around on a tractor, and a lot of your stuff is being transported by truck. Right. So yeah, the industrialization of it is part of the the broad industrialization stuff of transport and everything else. There is also, I guess, the biological process of cow farting, which does directly contribute methane to the atmosphere. Yeah. And, like, we can have a really fun time complaining about cows and cow farting and methane decomposition 
from anaerobic decomposition of like farm waste and like cow poop and swine poop and you know livestock poop but like really it doesn't come anywhere near as close as the consumption of fossil fuels right yeah, absolutely if we were just dealing with farts and anaerobic decomposition they would be much easier to deal with yeah so there are some basic statistics that go into this and what we care about really is how do you measure carbon yeah that shit's tiny yeah I'm going to need a much smaller scoop. Mm -hmm. And it's a gas. Okay, I'll have to hold the scoop upside down. <laughs> and make sure you don't have one with holes in it. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, that's tougher. Mm -hmm. If I just put two scoops together, just sort of hold them really tight. Only if the holes perfectly match the non-holes on the other one. All right, I don't think our, the ones in the drawer are going to cover it. No. Continue. So what we really want is a way to measure all contributing factors to climate change. But we tend to stick with CO2 because that's the easiest one to talk about. It's the easiest, and from what I'm gathering, it's also... By, by such an immense factor, the most important, that if we can get in in line, the cows farting ain't so much a big deal. Yeah. In the atmosphere, we talk about what's called parts per million. So in a million molecules of gas in the atmosphere, how many of those molecules are carbon dioxide? So it's written as PPM in the atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, you said PP. Pee -pee. I did. <laughs> and uh, so at the moment, that 0.04% translates to 400 PPM. The penis per minute yep. in the atmosphere is 0 0.04. If, uh, what, what no, would it be? that's 0.04%, so that's parts per 100. Right, gotcha. 400 I, parts I, per I said it wrong. I, yep. I follow, I follow. What should it be? Should is a very relative term, right? But generally lower. Lower. Like, I think, okay. in, I think in the 50s, it was about 300 parts per million. So that's a 30% increase in less than 100 years. Right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So I think the lowest that it is recorded as being is like 280 parts per million. These are like from ice cores and things. And that was during like global glaciation. The highest it's been recorded as being was like a couple of thousand. And that was when we had like tropical forests in Antarctica. There's a really great graph if folks want to look it up from the Mauna Loa Observatory of CO2 since they're measuring it from the 60s. Yeah. There are like really long ice cores and stuff like that that get us back like thousands and tens and thousands and all kinds of like really long years. But if you want to put it into relative terms, you can we can look up the, the stuff from the Scripps Institute out there at Mauna Loa. Yeah. So the graph roughly looks like this and then you hit the 60s and it goes like that, which is bad. But line goes up. <laughs> Look, I know that this runs counter to every bit of our ideology, but line go up is not always a good thing. Okay. From on the ground emissions, we want to know how much CO2 something produces. Is produced by the Captain Planet Crime Factory. Yeah, exactly. So there are a couple of ways of doing it. The first one is as tons of CO2. Tons, mate. Yeah, tons. Thanks to the carbon cycle and the impact on energy retention in the atmosphere, the total amount is not actually the only thing we care about, because there are processes that remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. They are perhaps not doing it as efficiently as we need, which is why the carbon is going up, but how long carbon dioxide hangs around in the atmosphere is also important to think about. The argument goes that one ton emitted in a single year is different in its effect on the global climate compared to one ton emitted over 10 years, even though it is on the whole one ton of carbon dioxide. Right, in the same way that if you were to inject me with a with poison doing it... Yes, the dose matters. The dose matters yeah, yeah, over yeah. the period of time. Gotcha. I'm guessing, Calvin, the trees come into play here. Oh, we'll get to that in just a second. Well, hang on. Like, I want to hear Calvin talk about the trees. No, no, no. Trees definitely come into play. We will get to the trees. Don't yeah. worry. So with carbon credits, we don't actually assume permanent removal from the carbon cycle or atmosphere. We assume that carbon is stored for some period of time. So we come to what are called ton years. This is an excellent invention. I'm glad we could figure this out on this podcast. So the name of the unit is suggestive for how it's constructed. It's ton year, not ton per year. So you are multiplying the tons and the years to get the units. Right. So if we have, uh, here we're going to have tons, we're going to have years, we're going to have ton years. If we have one ton in one year, that's one ton year. Yeah. Yes. If we have two tons in one year, that's two ton years. Right, okay. If we have half a ton in two years, 
that's one ton a year because you have half a ton each year and that adds up to one. Okay, so it's 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 how many years of that measure. Yeah. It's not two it's not half a ton over two years. No, that would be tons per year. Right, okay. Yeah. And then if we have like one ton for ten years, we get ten ton years. Okay, so in ten ton years, yep. there's ten tons. There are ten tons, yes, total. So it's one ton per year. Yes. Okay. Yep. So uh one ten per year for ten years. Right. That's the important bit. Can you it's... put tons like over years, tons per year, tons slash year? Okay, so ton per year. This would be one, this would be two, uh half divided this would be a quarter, tons per year. No, that'll be a half, sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting. Sorry, I just yeah. got slightly confused by the um, yeah, the way we're producing. So this is a t- sorry, this is tons per year, I suppose here. Yeah, that's what I was going to yeah. say. Okay. That's, that's actually what I wanted you to change. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> per year. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So in case anyone was wondering, this is an IPPC development like term. We're not just making this up here. This this is a real thing. So, so specifically, I- we are not making this up on this podcast. Somebody else made it up. What is the IPCC? International Panel on Climate Change. Yep, a bunch of a bunch of nerds who do nerd stuff. <laughs> yep. I I can say that I'm a professor. Look, who's among us? Oh, we've got an international panel on it. Why don't they just? <laughs> why don't they just decide to do less climate change? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> See, that's the problem. Yeah. There's someone in one of the scientists in the big climate change room has actually been leaning on the climate change like turn up lever yeah. lever, and we just haven't figured it out yet. We're just going to have to keep dealing with that. Yes, Captain Planet, this man right here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's really tragic, actually. Mm, okay. There's a whole, like, slapstick of people in very serious T-shirts with pocket protectors and things, and because they are dorks and thus clumsy, yeah, yeah. they'll walk past and go, whoop, dial back up again. Oh, yeah. yeah. They come back and turn it, oh, which way do I turn it? Ooh, and then- yeah, because an engineer designed it, it's not properly labeled. Right, of course. <laughs> Okay. So there are some key aspects of calculating this in practice. We need the amount of the initial emission. Can we actually, like, physically measure it, or do we just sort of... We will get to that. Okay. Yep. (laughs) Don't worry. We will get to that. We need some rate of removal. From the atmosphere. From the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. So this is... You'll sometimes see this referred to as a decay rate, but the carbon's not, you know, vanishing into nothing. It's just being processed into other parts of the planet. Right, Right, okay. And then we need what's called a time horizon. I just had a great idea. You know how if um, something has a half-life, half of it disappears, mm-hmm. what if we just made all the carbon in the atmosphere highly radioactive? That would not solve climate change because the radioactivity would output energy. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And that's the only reason why that's bad. Yes. Yeah, for sure. Okay. It turns out this, <laughs> this whole climate change thing, complicated. Well, not that complicated. Yeah. It's annoying to deal with. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought we were going to solve it before we had to go to <laughs> breakfast. In, in Unfortunately, no. I mean, we really easily could. We just couldn't put the solution into action. It would just be stop doing fossil fuels. Yeah, right. Oh my god, Th- this is the most fucking infuriating thing. And I'm go- I'm going to talk about my research in a bit because my PhD research is actually directly related to this topic. But stepping into this space has just made it abundantly clear that we know what we fucking have to do. We've known what we have to do for a generation or two. The problem is the politics, and no amount of scientific research actually changes the politics. Well, that guy did scientifically research how to make the machine that makes Shinzo Abe go away. <laughs> this is very true. So, <laughs> <laughs> truly the only good argument for the great man of history theory. And I, by the way, am not making any specific or actionable threat as a result of that. <laughs> <laughs> for the recording. You guys are under British of... law. That's right. No, we're under Australian law. No, no, no. But you guys have the, the really strong basis in the British like law stuff. Yeah, yeah. I assume your libel laws are very similar. No, ours are actually better. Oh, well, but good for you. We're not, look, we're not, yeah. we're not quite bald eagle screaming free. I'm getting the whip out. <laughs> oh, no. I'm dra- yep, I'm dragging us back. Oh, so okay. definitely aren't free, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the, ti- the time horizon is basically how long do you care about this amount of carbon? How long into the future are you looking to calculate how much of this stuff hangs around? So I'm going to draw another picture here to demonstrate that. The time horizon when talking about climate change sounds very ominous. <laughs> While Tess is drawing this out, I will say we've also known that climate change was going to happen, and I'm going to reference a very obscure paper here, 
since like the 1800s, like late 1800s. So like this has been a known and solved problem since the 1800s. Anyway, you can keep drawing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's say we have our uh, ton tons here, right? So in the first year, we're going to say we have one. In the second year, we'll say the decay rate is roughly a half. So in the second year, we have a half, then a quarter, then one on eight, and then one on 16. So I'm assuming decay is like halved. Sorry, you just said we don't use the word decay. You said removal. Um, yeah, okay. Rate of removal. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. <laughs> would it likely be that consistent or would there be like fluctuations in real life? So this is a theoretical model because there is such, there's a lot of variation in concentration across the planet, right? You go into a city, the carbon dioxide is higher than in the middle of the countryside in a farm or something like that. So the assumption is that across the globe, the average behavior looks something like this. This is, of course, a theoretical model because the real one is a little bit more complicated, but let's say that half per year. And this is also, I have drawn this as columns. Uh, if you are doing this properly, you actually just get like a, a smooth curve down like that, and then you use calculus to get the area under the curve, and that gives you your volumes. It's right. However, because I refuse to do calculus, you've spared me that. I have spared you that. Okay. Okay, is so, there an issue that the rate, like, while it is a steady rate of removal, the last little bit is sort of sticky? Yeah, well, that's that's kind of why this time horizon matters, right? So if you have a five-year time horizon, what you get here is one plus a half, plus a quarter, plus an eighth, plus a sixteenth. Right, I follow you, yeah. That's a slash, which is, I have this written down somewhere, 1.9375 ton years in total. Right. If your time horizon is three years, that's one plus a half plus a quarter, which is 1.75. So, so it's not just about what we're outputting right now. We also have to deal with the fact that we've got... It hangs around and how long it hangs around for. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible to oversaturate the um, methods of removal? Definitely. We believe so. And that's fucking terrifying, frankly. Okay, so that, is that where, you, where you, it's like just fucking game over? Because uh, That's why I have the herbicides on my back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why are you killing... Wait. We'll get there. We'll get Kill, there. The herbicides are for weeds. Weed. Okay. We'll, we'll okay. get there. Yeah, yeah. So one other factor of this is that if you are somebody with a carbon credit and you have one ton year of carbon credit, that is more valuable if you are looking at a three-year time horizon than if you're looking at a five-year time horizon. Because your one-ton year carbon credit accounts for 57% of that three-year 1.75 time years, but only 52% if you're looking at the five years. So if you are selling carbon credits, a shorter time horizon is beneficial to you. So the financialization is incentivized to ignore this tale. Yes. And, uh, in fact, broadly defined, these tails are difficult to deal with um, yeah. because they're small around amounts, but they fucking build up. This is one of the problems with this kind of modeling is that at some point you just say, oh, we don't care about that bit. But there's potentially a lot of that bit. But if I was to remove a ton yep. of carbon from, if I was to behave a change to reduce the output of someplace by a ton, yep. I've also reduced its tail to nothing as well. Yes. So this is part of the issue here. It's not a problem when you're using it to actually affect change, but if you're talking about theoretically reducing it... it it's not a, well, it's not a problem if you're using it to actually affect change. The problem is, are you using it to actually affect change? Right. I, and, I hope and, my cynicism was sort yeah, of implied there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the big problem about these things is it doesn't fucking work. We'll get to that. The other problem is people do that exact argument without the cynicism. Yes. This is a very fine measure for thinking about the damage you're doing, but then undoing that damage or thinking about the impact of this in the long term, Tanya kind of has issues because it's not meant to do these things. It's meant to help us think about the damage that is being done. So if I was to maybe skip ahead in our chat here, is the ultimate output of this that what carbon credits actually trade is blame tess is doing a, a sort of a sort of <laughs> happy smile there so what we're really trading here is culpability for what we've decided is going to happen because otherwise 
The light would not go up. Otherwise, the light would not go up. Is okay, it? sure. If you just excuse me, I'm going to shoot myself in the fucking head. <laughs> I, I would say maybe, but like also we know who did it, so like not really. It's like balance sheet. They have names and addresses. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and now we're going to look at it in even more fun form of the balance sheet wrangling. So this calculation is at the point of the emission. Right, yeah. If you are calculating the ton years of a credit, you have to do something slightly different. So we're going to talk about two particular ways of calculating a carbon credit. The first one is called Mora Costa. Mora Costa? I don't even know her. Which is that uh, the credit is calculated as the uh, tons. Calvin, Tess likes to... by the years. Tess likes to just pretend I haven't made jokes, but you don't have to do that to <laughs> laugh. I'm just going to... No, it's, I, 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 I got you. My wife does the exact same thing. <laughs> And actually, so do my students. Oh, a lot of people do that too. <laughs> yeah, so you no, I'm funny. Podcast <laughs> I'm funny. I'm funny. I don't care what everyone else says. Make a pact here. I'll laugh at yours, Calvin, if you laugh at mine. Yeah, yeah. that sounds good. All right, done. Okay, so the Mora Costa says that the amount of a carbon credit is how many tons you are storing times the years you are storing. The problem is, this doesn't deal with the fact that what happens when you stop storing it, it gets re-emitted. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way to, like, bury it? Oh, well, I mean, that's kind of a, a big question, right? I mean, look, all I'm saying, Dean, is you can never again complain about my habit of collecting books. Because technically, that's a carbon sink. Okay. Th yeah, that's, that's carbon storage. You know, <laughs> that's storage yeah. right there. Long term. I mean, some of those books are like over 100 years old. So really long term, in fact. Mm, okay. Yeah. I'll stop burning them. I'm going to be really honest. Fantastic. When I was first getting into this space, I made a very distasteful analogy, which was because the Notre Dame had just burned up. And I was like, that's, a, that's carbon released from like the 1800s <laughs> yeah like like very fair and good in a scientific perspective not really culturally sensitive but it was also to the french <laughs> i was gonna say i think that's funny it was so kind of <laughs> fucked of you to do it while standing on the ruins of Notre Dame <laughs> and holding a lit torch yeah yeah <laughs> I, mean, hey, I was in france i was smoking to be clear <laughs> <laughs> One approach to dealing with this is what's called the lash-off method, which includes re-emission with decay, or with removal. I'm going to draw another picture, aren't we lucky? Um, so here we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, I don't need the rest of it, we'll just go to there. So let's say I take a ton out of the atmosphere and I keep it for two years. So I come down here, and I have negative one ton, negative one ton, for two years. Right. So the Mora Costa, Mora Costa method says that is equal to negative two as a carbon credit, right? I'm using the negative number here to represent that it's removed stuff. The Lashoff then says, okay, at the end of those two years, you emit, so you get a plus one, and then you have your decay. Right, yep. Right, so this is a half quarter and so on right so the lash off includes this and there's no decay during the no removal during the period of storage well no the assumption is that the storage was the initial removal right but let's say i put all the carbon in a box right yep and i've got this box of carbon when i go to release it none of the carbon has like become a residue on the sides that i can then put down a hole or something no so the the general assumption is for this simplified version that you have total re-emission this may or may not actually be the case and depending on the particular method of storage it may or may not be the case right so like we'll get to this in a bit but if you grow a forest that stores like if you grow a tree that stores that much right and when the tree dies, it doesn't completely decompose. Some of that carbon will probably stick around in the soil. It's become the hated fungus. Yes. Yeah. Or the even more, if you're in Pennsylvania, hated white-tailed deer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. So for the lash-off model, and let's say we're looking at five years. Oh, so we've got 1.97, etc. Well, we've got a, a minus two, which is the first two years. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, one, two, three, four, five. Then we have plus... 1.75 so this gives us negative 2.0.25 ton years this is one eighth of that well the um time horizon comes into play here because of how much re-emissions you count right okay but does this actually like help the planet oh we'll get to that <laughs> <laughs> okay that's yeah. a no <laughs> but the basic logic here right is that these are some of the ways that people calculate what they are selling as carbon credits. Okay. And that matters 
because one of them says you're doing an awful lot more than the other. And if you do not, in fact, have a standardized method of calculating this, if, for example, you're a very, very poorly regulated system with no particular oversight, yeah. you don't necessarily know which of these is involved in a particular carbon credit. Right. And basically you can, because you can just be a fucking snake oil salesman and say, yeah, I'm selling this much removal, even though the way I'm counting it is just... The, the more Acosta method, yeah. Yeah. Because, because, of course you'd use that if you're trying to sell shit. Yeah. I am willing to believe that there are some people in the industry who genuinely want to actually change stuff and are trying to be as transparent as possible. Yeah, admit I don't people. think that's most... Yes. I would say that's accurate. Yeah. So I am sure that there are people who, for example, tell you which method they use, give you some example calculations, and let you determine whether or not you think that's believable. But there is a whole industry that does not incentivize that because capitalism. Right, yeah. I've heard about this this capitalism thing. I'm thinking it may be an issue. It might be. The other part of this, if you take more Acosta at face value, right? Storing one ton of carbon for five years would let you potentially emit more than a ton of carbon in the first place. This is the opposite of what you want. Oh, oh right. So you emit 1.5 and then pay for one ton to be taken out for two yeah, years. Yeah, well, let's just look. At, so um, if we come back to here, right? If we have a five-year time horizon, let's take the three-year time horizon, right? So this says, in total, I'm looking at 1.7 years, 75 uh, ton years, right? If I have a minus two credit here... This is all just fucking around with the with the balance sheet. Again. Yes. Yeah. This is all fucking around with the balance sheet. But this is a statistical construction that is having very real impact. Right. This is one of the reasons that I have um, some issues with the industry is because this sort of fuckery happens. Yeah. This is, this is again for much later. My thesis here is... We don't need to measure this. This is the accounting method, right? This is what is used to basically work out, in theory, if you have a reasonable and consistent method, how much credit do you need in order to keep doing what you're doing? So how much do you need to pay to keep doing what you're doing effectively? Yeah. Unlike an actual direct tax on carbon emissions, which we had for one bright and shining moment here in Australia, and it worked really, really well, you have this fuckery. Oh, that's really cool. I'm jealous. Like, very right, quickly. Yeah. That, so that, that would have been cool. It got ripped away very quickly. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a massive campaign by the miners against it, of course, and it contributed to the Labour Party losing the election. And Wait, so you guys what? have, like, fully automated mines that are run by, like, two people. How do, like, two people... Ugh, whatever. I, sorry, I, li I also live in coal country, and there are also, like, four mines at work that employ eight people, so... <laughs> I understand, but, like, God... It's not about the two people that work on the mine. It's about the one person who owns the mine yeah. and has a lot of money to pay for fear mongering. We so, went back to anyway. the capitalism. I know. It's almost like someone should seize the means of production. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, hold on. Write this one down as well. Write that thought down. And then potentially shut some of them down. Yeah. <laughs> huh. Okay. So how do we spell so, this means of... <laughs> <laughs> so, in this, right, we have a whole bunch of estimation processes going on as well. We have the estimation of the original amount. We have the estimation of the carbon credit, how much is observed in storage. We have the estimation of the removal process. Those are also statistical constructions. So let's talk a bit about them. Calvin, this is where I'm going to defer to you. How does an industry estimate how much CO2 they're putting out? Well, so you have a lot of different ways to do it. There is no one single way. It depends on who you are, what the industry is, and how honest you want to be. So the first mm -hmm. thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at our first order emissions. So going back to our big smokestack factory that produces Captain Planet Crimes. It's how much smoke is coming out of that stack. If you want to look at it, we can also look at the inputs into that smokestack. So if we are burning coal in the smokestack because Captain Planet is our enemy, how much are we putting out and how much did that release? Well, yeah. actually, be, we're starting to get to second order now. So how much CO2 is coming out of that stack? That's how we would measure our first order impact. Okay, so that is basically you have some sort of device in your chimney that samples the air that's coming out and says this much of it is CO2. 
Yeah. Well, some people will measure it as just like what comes out of this thing. And there are estimation problems in that, yeah. 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 Yeah, and then some some will also tell you that first order is also like what are the emissions that went into creating like to getting the coal out of the ground to burn in the stack. The second order yeah. emissions are going to be what goes into your supply chain. So that's going to be yeah. coal coming out of the stack as well as you need underpaid folks to shovel coal into our furnace. So their commute yeah. what they emit in the mm. com- in their commute. So we're going to measure all of those impacts, and that's going to give us our second order impacts. And then our third order impacts are going to be, what are all of the emissions for all of the things that go into our crime factory here? So like the emissions from our employees and them having to exist in this area, and <laughs> the emissions yeah. from all the stuff that, you know, the third order impacts is basically the emissions of the world. Like, to be very honest. Yeah, mm. yeah like, all of the uh, parts we import from Crime Factory 2 to run Crime Factory 1. Well, so that would probably all be second-order emissions, but it's like, what do the people who are in your Crime Factory, what do they need to survive? Like, what are the emissions yeah, right. from them? The stuff from Crime Factory 3. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're underpaying all of the, the workers in Crime Factory 1, and, like, there's someone, like, you know, cracking a whip, like, ah, burn it faster. So that's that's how we're going to measure our emissions. <laughs> Generally, we care most about our first and second order effects because third order effects are just like hard. Yeah, and the, and the third order comes down much faster once we reduce the first and second order effects. Yeah. Okay. So within that first bit is also something like how much fuel are you burning, right? Yeah. This is a, an annoyingly pedantic podcast, but is the amount of coal that you burn a better estimate of the amount of CO2 that's produced than what's coming out of the smokestack? Probably. Okay. It's a kind of an interesting question because you have all things like incomplete combustion and all the rest of it, and things that are not carbon that are in your coal. Back to our mercury and sulfur. Yeah, but like you can get an idea of the chemical composition of the coal that you're burning, yep. and you can potentially have a reasonable idea of the combustion process. I would also say it's easier for the average person to like think back to the fuel emitted and getting that out of the mines and getting it from the mine to the factory. Yeah. Like, it's easier to count the inputs. Right, yeah. And also, you can think of it, I think, in your day-to-day life, it's much easier to think, how much fuel am I putting in my car, than it is to think how much CO2 is coming out the back end. Right. So from there, there is all the fuckery around how much offset is required, and then there is broadly defined the estimation of the removal process. I'll put slash storage here. Yeah, the storage is really key. Lot, there's a lot of yeah. focus on removal and not as much on storage when I think they should be equally balanced. Because if we just take it out of the atmosphere... Make more books. Right. Ex- unironically, <laughs> yes. yes. Quite, I'm not joking. So I, I do have a, a question here. Other than growing trees, what options are there? Well, so we can so we can do better agriculture that will hopefully build soil and sequester carbon in soil. Okay. We can build with wood, and then we can sequester car- we can start store carbon in the wood buildings. We can't really do much stuff with the oceans. But that is fundamentally, if we're building with wood, that's tree based. Yeah, you're right. There's yeah. not much that we can do with the oceans. Those are too large of systems and systems you can't work with. Yeah. You know, if you go out and dump a bunch of iron filings in the Pacific, that's probably not going to do much. Plus, like, that's uh, probably not a great idea. So, so why dump iron filings in the Pacific? So the idea is that, like, so there are phytoplankton in the Pacific. Phytoplankton are small plants and other single-cell organisms that eat the plants and eat other stuff. And if you dump iron filings out there, you'll spur growth. And they because they're plants, they'll capture carbon out of the atmosphere yeah, right. through photosynthesis, and it'll get stored when they die and slowly like work their way through the ecosystem or fall to the bottom of the ocean. Right, okay. Uh, the problem is oceans are really big, and like doing it doesn't really work that well, because like iron filings are not a nu- are not like nutrient available. Yeah, I bet. Oh, you could do grassland stuff? You could, you could do stuff with grasslands. Sorry, I forgot those. Okay, so grasslands... Right, so we are fundamentally depending on the process of photosynthesis here. Yeah. I have seen some uh, wistful proposals that we could use other yet-to-be-defined, as far as I can tell, technologies. Yeah. Like, what, what's the pie-in-the-sky stuff for carbon sequestration that's coming out at the moment? So there's, like, a plant in Iceland that can capture carbon out of the atmosphere 
and then pump it underground. You can do that in very specific geological formations with very specific technology. It's pretty energy intensive, so the energy required to run the equipment to capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and pump it underground also has to be renewable energy. Mm. It's it's rather ineffective. I mean, the plant in Iceland is going to like sequester 4,000 tons this year, which is like uh, maybe a little bit more. That doesn't sound like a lot. No, it's it's yeah. not a lot. It's a good start, but it's not a lot. Yeah, well, it's okay. a start. Yeah. It's not a lot. It's something. I think it might be a little bit more than 4,000. But it's, you know, it's something, but it's, it's very much not a lot. If we listen to all the news reports, carbon capture is very, very much going to be a thing in the next 10 years. I was going to say, it's 10 <laughs> years away, right? <laughs> yeah. I was just going to say, we should have self-driving cars by now. I go back to the, the TF thinking of this and they're like, a wizard will invent carbon capture. Yes. Yeah, well, like, to, to my eye, the, the primary thing is that it's a gas. And gases are hard to deal with. So fundamentally, unless you're going to, like, put it in tanks and stick it in a salt mine or something, it's very, very difficult to deal with the fact that it's a gas. You have to change it into something solid, preferably, yeah. in order to actually properly store it for a long period of time. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm forgetting about my favorite carbon storage idea. It's called BEX, Biorenewable Carbon Capture and Storage. So basically you take some kind of bioenergy source, so like be it trees, be it sugarcane, be it whatever, some kind of plant. Yeah. You grow it in a way that it is capturing carbon out of the atmosphere and adding carbon to the soil. Then you combust it in a power plant. You capture all of the carbon from the combustion and you pump it into those geological formations that are good for it. So one of the things that I've seen proposed is you pump it into like shale deposits in South Dakota and, like, that should be carbon-negative energy because it's, you know, you're capturing carbon out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil. I hear that, and I hear, oh, you pump it into shale deposits. So, like, it's not going to stay there. Yeah, yeah, we, we already broke all those shale deposits in South Dakota. That's why the, yeah. the oil fields are a thing. <laughs> also, yeah. like, the capture technology doesn't exist, and you have to build the pipelines. And, like, what are we doing, guys? <laughs> At its heart, the only thing that I have seen that is mildly convincing is basically grow a shitload of trees and then put the wood in a salt mine. That's actually going to keep it there. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say we want to turn that wood into biochar and put that in a salt mine. And I'm going to be really honest, if you wanted to get into biochar, that's a whole cult. <laughs> I'm sure we will discuss biochar. Oh, go on. Now would be the time. Let's go. <laughs> okay, hold on. Let me, let me back up. So biochar is a lot like charcoal. So you just pyrolyze any kind of carbon-based thing. So I'm so by pyrolyze, you mean burn without oxygen? Right. Yeah. So you, you can do it at a low temperature or at a high temperature without oxygen under pressure. And so you get this. It looks a lot like charcoal. It's used a lot right now in beauty products and fish filters. And it's kind of as a soil additive. I like the idea of biochar. I mean, before we get into this whole thing, but it hasn't really taken off. It, it has a lot of great properties if you are thinking about it for a soil additive. It has been used as a soil additive in a lot of tropical places in Terra... I forget what it's called right now. It's Terra something in some dead civilizations that were in the Amazon. Uh, it's a great soil additive because it adds it adds nutrient-holding properties to your soil, water-holding properties, and can help filter out right. pollutants. Great, So it's great in fish filters. And then also, like, when you want to make, like a, like, a face scrub, it's good for that. The thing is, is it doesn't have a market. Right. So it doesn't happen. So, like, in Pennsylvania, where I live, uh, it costs between 140 to $500 a cubic yard, which is way too expensive to put in the soil, which would be our best application for it. Because we could just, like, the idea here being we could just plow most of the carbon from the atmosphere into the soil mm -hmm. and basically do reverse coal mining. Yeah. Or we could just, like, go in hard and just dump it all into the old coal mines. Yeah. And just really just reverse coal mine. But that's not happening. We could rebuild those mountaintops that got removed in the Appalachian. Oh, that's West Virginia. That's not Pennsylvania. We did hard rock stuff. We're underground. <laughs> <laughs> that's why we have sinkholes that sometimes eat neighborhoods. <laughs> that happened to a neighborhood across us. But that was a limestone sinkhole. Probably not related to mining. I mean, just going to say, it's bad, but at the same time, you would want to see that. If you could see a sinkhole just take a neighborhood in real life, sick. Yeah. <laughs> the Earth is fighting yeah. back. Yeah. This is like the orcas, but geological. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Orcas break at Earth. Biochar is really cool. It's just not happening. It, it's a very classic chicken or the egg problem. Like, there's no market, so that there's no product. There's no product, so there's no market. Yeah, yeah. I will make my quaint joke about chicken and the egg problems. 
is, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, we know the egg evolved first. This is yeah. a stupid joke. It was born by something that was not a chicken. Right, yeah. This is a stupid joke. We know the egg evolved millions of years before the chicken <laughs> did. All right, move along. Nerd shit. Nerd shit. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. So we could really do a lot of biochar stuff. It just doesn't work under capitalism. Anyway. Yeah. I am now going to talk a bit about the estimation process for the tree options. So if you have trees, and we'll say plants broadly defined, but I work with trees, so I'm going to talk about trees. Yeah, trees are way cooler than Forbes. <laughs> so this is CO2 becomes, like, cellulose and sugars, and basically gets embedded in wood. Hell yeah, that's my shit. Yeah. So what you are looking to do to estimate the amount of carbon that is invol involved here is estimate wood growth. And that's really easy to do. Mm, yeah, God. I mean, look, I'm getting a PhD out of this, so, you know, I'm not going to complain too much about the fact that it's a harder problem. Yeah. But, yeah. Like, on an abstract level, it's very easy to estimate the amount of carbon in wood growth. And in specific systems, we can pretty accurately, assuming things go well, estimate how much wood grows, because we've been doing that for a long time. So to estimate how much carbon is in wood, you take the dry weight of the wood and you multiply it by 0.5. The exact amount of carbon in that piece of wood depends. It's species specific, but you just do a little like a squiggly sign. You go, hey, it's around 0.5. And I love the, uh, I'm going to put it in here, the approx sign. Yeah, that one. This one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The struggle from the person who's doing the PhD in a perspective is getting access to the dry weight of the wood. Yeah. Because if you are looking at a living forest, you cannot directly measure that because it would require you to kill the forest. Oh, so I just measured the Amazon. We're already cutting that down. Yeah, it's true. So that's easy to measure. I've heard that it's like one of the problems with this uh, system is that um, new growth forests burn much easier than old growth forests. Is that like, does that factor in? Oh, now we're getting into a weird place. Yeah. So we'll talk about that in a bit. There is more I want to say about this first. It is relatively easy if you have a, a nice temperate forest to get estimates of growth rates for trees because you can look at tree rings. That's me. That's me. I do that. Annual tree rings are fantastic. Yeah. It's also really easy where you have systems that have been studied for a long time for commercial purposes because we know what they're going to do. And we have done the generational, not human generation, but the forest generational studies. So, because I'm temperate hardwood forests that have been managed by Europeans for a while. And we've like, like some of the first forestry schools in the US have been set up here. So I know what's been going on here for a hundred plus years. The second you leave places where like, we know every tree species and you go to the tropics, it gets really crazy really fast. Cause like you're discovering trees every time you go to Brazil. <laughs> well, discovering for science, not the people there. When you have these consistent annual tree ring processes for a particular tree, you can take core, you can say, okay, this is the rate at which it's growing. We can compare that to the other trees of the same species and say, we anticipate it will be this much bigger in 50 years. So we anticipate that it will have absorbed this much more carbon. This is not necessarily very good at accessing underground systems. So like roots don't seem to show up very much in the calculations of carbon storage. No, we totally discount those. Yeah, which is, well, it means that your estimates are more conservative, shall we say, than they would otherwise be, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's, it's better. But it does mean that there is an error. Nobody yeah. tell carbon credits people this so they can No, say. absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> no one tell the capital. Podcast listener, you are forbidden from telling <laughs> these people. <laughs> so I work with tropical forests. I work with trees that may have tree rings, but they are not consistently annual. So you can't use that kind of structure to estimate the growth. This includes that slightly interesting band around the equator, which is all the tropical forests there, but also in Australia, eucalypt species on the whole don't have annual tree rings which means that we don't know how old they get and we don't know how fast they grow. So our ideas about how much carbon sequestration actually happens in the tropics, in Australia, in all these species are a lot of, oh, we think it's kind of like this, question mark. So my PhD is actually using something we can get, which is external size measurements of trees over time to see if we can get estimates of the underlying growth behavior. On the whole, these are not particularly good estimates, right? I am actually able to make some improvements, which I'm really proud of, but like, we don't really know how these forests operate. We don't really know 
how much carbon is being absorbed by these trees. We don't really know when the trees die, what happens to that carbon. Please do correct me if I'm wrong here, but aside from some amount of soil buildup, if you have an established old growth forest that's not expanding, is it actually absorbing all that much carbon? By definition, an old growth forest should have no net productivity. Yeah, right. So it should have no inputs and no outputs. Well, I mean, you know, obviously it has outputs being carbon dioxide and methane from decomposition. It's net productivity. Right. So the, the in inputs will equal the outputs, right? right? Yeah, that's definitional yeah. for, you know, how I define old growth forest, which is using the dictionary of forestry from the Society of American Foresters. Yeah. Other people have very different definitions of old growth forest, and I say, let's have a fight. <laughs> so in that sort of context, when we are talking about carbon credits in regards to forestry, what we're really talking about is either you are planting new trees, or, and this is one that, frankly, I do not quite believe, you are preventing somebody from chopping them down. Yeah, there's also a third option, which is very difficult to measure, which is your improving current management in that forest so that the trees grow to full maturity, or they recruit, or they, they grow better and you can do more things with them. Recruiting is specifically that seedlings survive to maturity. Right? Yeah, shit, I use the nerd talk again. So this is, this is going from seed to tree. Yeah. Uh, I do want to go back for one second, though, Tess, to what you said about, like, size. So tree size does not equal tree age. Yeah, absolutely. If you put it, just like a person, if you put a, tr a tree in a stressful place, it does not grow fast. One of the oldest and slowest growing trees was like 175 years old and was less than two inches tall. Two inches tall or two inches wide? Uh, I think it was two inches tall and they cut it out because it was growing by Thunder Bay and they cut it off off a rock and they sanded down their root collar and looked at the root collar. But it was very small. It was uh, okay. less than a foot tall, let's say for sure. And the root collar yeah. is super small. So tree diameter, which is what we're speaking when we say size, is related to species, the genetics of that tree, and a lot to where it's growing specifically. If it is in a place where that tree is happy, it will grow big fast. If the tree is stressed, it will not grow as big as fast. So one of the um, fun little facts of working in tropical forests is that you will have various shade tolerant species. So these are understory saplings and seedlings and things that will just sit there for 30 years, not produce any new leaves, which is genuinely a surprise, and not get any bigger. And then a gap will open up in the canopy that gives them access to some light and they will shoot up in a decade. Yeah, we have those in the hardwoods. It's not as many. Like, hickory does that a lot, but there's not a lot of species that go from mid-story to overstory. Most of our mid-story species, so these are trees for folks who are not foresters or not thinking about trees that are, like, between, like, 10 and 20 meters tall, and then they'll go yeah. up to, like, 30 meters tall, if I'm doing my conversion right. So, like, between, like, 30 and 40 feet or 20 and 40 feet, I don't, depends on how you define mid-story, and then go to like 100 feet tall. Yeah, and in that process, they suck up an awful lot of carbon in producing that wood. Oh. So, like, one of the things that we are interested in, we being, like, broadly defined people looking in this <laughs> space, right, is how does that increase in width relate to an increase in height as well? Because an increase in width across a bigger height is going to be more wood. Estimating height as well as like tree diameter or tree width is really kind of important for estimating the amount of wood and growth involved. But again, it's a hard problem. And unless you have somebody going along and measuring the actual height of particular trees, which is very labor intensive, you may or may not get good estimates. So you basically have to rely on species level information of what is the max height of these trees at maturity. Because we are running out of time, I am cracking the whip again. But this is the fun bit. Kelvin, are carbon credits just a scam? Sometimes, yes. Most of the time, yes. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes, they're trying not to be. Sometimes, they're good. I would say a lot of times, yes. Yeah. That does not surprise me. <laughs> There's a lot of carbon credit programs, which is, I, which is what I say sometimes. Also, I'm a scientist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does seem to me like, ultimately, the problem is just, there's, so, there's only so much freaking carbon, and... You can just you can either stop putting it in the atmosphere or do a very long and slow process to get it out of the atmosphere. And fucking around with carbon credits to keep the crime factory running, it's just fucking around. Yeah. Like Yes. There's no there's no getting around the raw in and out equation of how much of it's fucking gas in above our heads. 
my, I guess, core question there is, I don't know how big the industry is or how long it's been going, to be perfectly honest, but has it made any impact? Oh, any impact? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, is, is, it, is it impact in, like, we are going, it has reduced carbon in the atmosphere? No, it's probably impacting the other way. No, oh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> so the reason I say that is because in the U.S., and I say that in the U.S. because New Zealand has a regulated scheme. In the U.S., carbon credits are largely unregulated. There is a regulated market. It's pretty small compared to all the carbon credits sold in the U.S., but it's largely unregulated. And people keep getting busted on, like, a judicial, like, hey, this is, like, F- fraud? FCC fraud. Yeah. <laughs> like, fraud. Not like, you know, us here, like, science are talking about science. Environmental crimes, yeah. Right, yeah. Like, this is FCC crime. That's why I'm saying, like, yeah, it's probably making impacts the other way that we would like to see it. Not even standing up to, like, scientific scrutiny. I was going to say, I've heard stories about people planting trees, in the, a.k.a. throwing saplings at the dirt, they fall over and die, and then they come back and do the same thing in the same place next year. I mean, well, that happens every like with every tree planting program to some extent, depending on how you how well you pay the tree planters. <laughs> but, like, we're talking about, like, people who will, like, claim – this happens a lot with tropical stuff – like, claim to do something, but they, first of all, don't have the legal right to do the thing, <laughs> and then they never make the attempt to do the thing. There's a very – there's a great case where a guy went to jail for this. He claimed – to protect parts of the Amazon, but the part of the Amazon that he was claiming to protect was owned by uh, a First Nation or I, I don't know how the indigenous people of the Amazon refer to themselves. So sorry to them. An indigenous group. So it was owned by the indigenous group. So he had no right. yeah. legal standing to own that land. So he claimed to do that on that land, but it turned out they, that they didn't because they didn't have legal standing. Anyway, some illegal loggers came and clear cut the whole forest, oh, and then they put cows out there. <laughs> so we have three and um, three levels of emissions from the credits that were, you know, the emissions that happened under the credit scheme that were never offset. Right. The emissions from the clear cutting of the rainforest, and then the emissions from, from the, the cows. cows. So I was actually too optimistic when I said it was about passing around blame, when in reality, <laughs> it's about building more crime factors. Yeah, yeah. Well, because this is, again, this is a completely unregulated space. This is, like, very similar to cryptocurrency, except this happens in real life. <laughs> you know, where cryptocurrency is, like, computer crimes. Like, these are not email scams. Like, these are scams that happen on forest land. There there are, like, actual land and materials involved in this. Right, okay. yeah. So there's another carbon company that did ton year accounting and so they said like if you don't harvest trees for a year we will sell the output from that harvest or from the lack of harvest in forestry if you have a harvest contract that contract is usually a two to three year contract to like sell like for the, the cut to happen because like weather happens so like you know if like a hurricane blows yeah. through you can't go out and harvest right normal so you could and i know people yeah. who did this who had harvest contracts so the trees are going to get cut at some point, but they sold two years of carbon credits, and then they had a harvest. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. So, so that's why I say, like, yeah, broadly, yeah. I would say these are probably negative. There are programs that do try to do real things, and they do try to do good things. But like, two programs trying to do real good things does not outweigh fourteen programs doing bad things. Yeah, absolutely. So we've got we had that three level one where somebody sold the carbon credits, then they cut, and then they built a farm. Could we get it to four levels by doing selling NFTs of carbon credits? <laughs> absolutely, yes. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, absolutely, that has happened. <laughs> oh, fucking god! <laughs> no! Actually, there'd probably be five levels because you also have the energy emissions. Not only from like generating the NFT, but also the person buying the NFT. Yeah, 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 absolutely, fantastic, good, very good. We're totally not going to die from all of <laughs> yeah, this. We're, Fuck. We're yeah, we're not going to be fine. <sighs> Chronic waste disease is going to get me before it, like climate change does. So I'm good there. <laughs> mm-hmm. So now we have the counterfactual, which is why measure this at all? Can't we just value forests for themselves? And this is something that Calvin, you posed to me, and I have been thinking about it. My first thought is. Well, fuck, we live in an economy. Not even a society. We live in a fucking economy. And as long as that capitalist logic dominates, to protect forests, we are forced to find arguments that align with it. That doesn't mean that we can rely on them as a long-term form of protection, because it's capitalism. It will exploit the shit out of whatever it can. But I think it's not a tool that we can afford to throw away in the meantime. 
I don't just mean, like, carbon credits. I think that should be, like, thrown away with great force, because clearly it's not fucking working. But I mean measuring carbon absorbed by forests. That, I think, is a tool that is currently usable to protect them. I'm interested to know what you think of that. Uh, you can't see because my camera's off, but I just did kind of like a like a eye up, like, yeah, kind of head shake. Yeah. Like, to some extent, yes, and to some extent, no. This is going to be, again, silly. But there's an idea of ecosystem services. You know, these things provide a service, so they are valuable just as the service, much like the post office is a service. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, the post office doesn't need to be profitable. Because it doesn't need to be. Ah, in Australia, the post office legally has to be profitable. Yeah, and in the US, they're trying to make it that way, too. <laughs> I know the Brits already went down that path, and we can all see how that went. So, like, yeah. if, if it's going to be capitalistic, let's call it a service, because these are services. I don't like that. Like, personally, I would like forests yeah. to be valued as forests. Yeah, we're going to cut them. We're going to burn them. We're going to kill invasive species, because that's what has to happen on forests. That's what has happened on forests for tens of thousands of years by all kinds of generations and nations of people. It's fine. Like, this is what's happened. This is how these forests have grown and lived. But like trying to run that for a capitalist perspective is not working. So if we're going to manage it with money in mind, which we have to, unfortunately, we can pay for them as a service. In the US, we can actually do that through the NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Like We have a thing that does that. We just don't put a lot of money into that. So in New Zealand, there is a, a framework called Kaitiakitanga, which are basically Maori principles of how we live as part of a natural environment and how we must take care to not like, overexploit it. So that's a legal framework as well. Like, it's written into law in some places. There is an argument to be made that even if we do consider everything in, like, these very bleak capitalist terms, there is a, a an amount of value generated by these ecosystems which we just sort of take for granted, but in fact must be managed in order to keep, you know, having that, that value come out. Yeah. So I think that as much as it, as, as it does like chafe against the dignity of living, of living beings to try and put a dollar value on Forests. photosynthesis, yeah. we could at least maybe try to make the capitalist system account for it if we started, you know, putting a stat screen that says this forest produces so much life. Giving oxygen. Well, and water <laughs> and other like yeah. things. I picked a bunch of blueberries today from our uh, forest. But yeah. I'm going to, again, I'm going to take the country position because this is not my podcast and I get to throw bombs sometimes. <laughs> I would say we've been trying to do that for like since the 90s and we haven't really come up with a great way to do that. The best example for ecosystem services comes from the city of New York, which instead of spending like $3 billion on a water processing, like a water cleaning plant, put a billion dollars into forest management in the water stream that feeds them, and it really paid out. But like that's the one example we have, really. Ecosystem services as an idea, a lot of time and effort has gone into it, and I have projects going on with those, and it hasn't really paid out yet in impacts on landscapes. So, yeah. you know, yeah. this is much like biochar, and like, we keep throwing effort into this, and we're not seeing anything out of it yet. Maybe we will, but I don't know. Look, come one, the revolution, this will not be a problem anymore, right? Well, right. kind of like what Tess said, but one of the things we talk about in this podcast is the fact that, you know, it's very easy to, as nerds and dorks and as people with a leftist inclination, get caught in the trap of saying, actually, it's better for everyone if we were to do this. Like, it's actually better for the capitalists if we also did this particular path. But that misses the, the I, I find the, the phrase, the cruelty is the point to be a little trite, but the, it turns out the, um, the superstructure is the point. And the, the structure that puts a limited number of people in control of so many other people's lives and resources and gives them so much power is both secured by A, those people in, in interests, but then also the, the algorithm of economy that puts all this shit together. My guess is just the act of spending less money to get better results out of investing in ecosystems is redistributive in the sense that you have to distribute value into fucking soil. And if people with money won't give money to other human beings, they're not going to give it to fucking trees. You get what I'm saying? Like, I think that there, there's there's these underlying realities of political economy, which come down to people are assholes. And thus, the only technology we could invent is one similar to... The guy who shot Shijalaba? No, I was going to say the machine that gets rid of ex, ex-prime ministers. But <laughs> again, we're not making any specific or actionable threat. And I, I'm, not being, I'm not trying to be a doomer, like that there's no political path to this. But obviously... Unless you're going to shortcut it with some kind of incredibly direct action, 
it seems there's so many structural forces in the way of these wonderful ideas. And I'm not using that term sarcastically. There's really good ideas about, hey, instead of a water processing plant, let's just stop fucking up the river. Like, that sounds great, but it feels like there's just so much in the way of that that makes it difficult, makes it more difficult than just having the good idea. Right now, I'm doing some herbicide work on NRCS contracts. So I'm going out, I'm killing invasive species like Tree of Heaven and Japanese barbarians, bush honeysuckle, NRCS contracts. The NRCS is a federal agency, is paying landowner to pay me to do this, to help the forest. Mm. Like, we could do this. It's already happening. I'm already getting a check for it. I can tell you right now, the yeah. money, the money goes. This is a doable thing. We know it can work and we know it, it can happen. The industries exist. Well, also, like in Australia, particularly around things, even things like mass bushfire prevention, the, the resources on the ground paying people to manage forests in Australia is fucking nothing. That is insane because we know that proper forest management prevents mass wildfires and we are seeing an increasing number of them. Good things are possible. For all that I always end up sounding very depressing on this podcast, I do fundamentally believe the good things are possible. But everything we've described, again... Is fucking depressing, yeah. It, everything we've described as possible, like funding these programs, etc., still requires an act of politics. And yep. politics right now just feels so untouchable. I feel, I feel so powerless in this realm. Yeah. Yeah, same. And so... The ability to translate the effort of my body, the literally the my muscles and blood, how do I translate that into making the forest nice? I could learn how to do it and go out there with a herbicide bottle, I guess, but I got to eat, right? You, somebody needs to pay for it. And yeah. that political decision just seems to be so frozen. Well, at the moment, Dean, what we can do is donate to the bail fund for the stop coal people who have been climbing on coal trains up in Newcastle. Those people make um, the worst people in the world so mad. Oh, that's great. And they are actually materially costing coal miners. So that's true. Okay. So that's two things they should... Sorry, right, coal, I'm going to... coal mine owners. owners. Yes. Coal miners, thankfully... Probably still going to be okay. And it makes trains better if you stop the bad trains. It makes the rest of the trains better. Exactly. And trains are yeah. good. I am going to stop us there. Kelvin, thank you so much for coming on. Where can people find you? Uh, I mean, like, I'm an academic. You can just look me up. You can find me on the internet. Okay. Just look up Calvin Norman and you can find me. I'm at Penn State. I have a book. I co-edited a book about carbon markets and stuff like that that people can find for free. They look it up under the Forest Owners Climate and Carbon Education. Uh, Fosse, F-O-C-C-E. It's a free book. You can look it all up. Fantastic. It's, Love a free book. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, Dean has already disappeared to play with the Bye. cat. But thank you so much for what, your time once again, and I'll see you later. Yeah, thanks, Deborah. Have a good one. See ya.